Hallelujah. <laughs> what a fabulous time of worship. My word, I call that intense. <laughs> Radical, real worship. Seldom, seldom experienced. There's something very special about it because as I looked around and watched and listened, I could see fervent, fervent love for Jesus. You can have worship times and it's all just lip service and or you're listening to the, the beat of the band or the lyrics sort of kind of cool and there's no real worship and the devil's not in the least bit worried about that he can say just keep it keep that up but when there is an intentional passionate sold out desperate love for Jesus where you want his glory and that alone God's impressed and the devil's has a headache <laughs> I think that's what we had here this morning I reveled in it and was right in with it with you I noticed that the last part was a, an intentional, intense cry out for the glory of God, correct? Is that right? What, what were the rest of you doing? Napping. This group here thinks that's what it was. Was it? Were, were you intentional on wanting the glory of God? Do you want Jesus Christ, the living Son of God, God, the creator and sustainer of the universe, to be glorified more than anything else? Yes. Do you? Okay, I'll tell you the price now. Okay, I'm reading from uh, the extract of something I read some years ago, which has never left me and impacted me greatly and so much so that I carry it around in my briefcase everywhere I go. And I did not know that this was on the program for today. Did you guys who were close to me see me right at the very last before I got up here, going into my, my bag and getting out these things? That was because of what was happening as you were crying out for the glory of God. And the Holy Spirit says to me, get that material out that you carry everywhere and tell them the price and say it smiling <laughs> because the price is awesome and above anything that you know or understand right now as to what you've prayed you haven't a clue what you're in for do you still want it? Yes. okay this is Pastor Francis Frangipane. Who knows him? Great friend of mine. Tremendous man of God. Amen? Amen? Okay. And he's writing, The year was 1973. I was pastoring a small church in Hilo, Hawaii, and had been in a month, not a week, not two weeks, not three weeks, a month of intense prayer and fasting. It was an earnest time of drawing near to God. I think that last statement's an understatement. At the end of this time, I found myself awakened during the night by a visitation of the Lord. It was not as though I saw his features. I saw his glory and was overwhelmed by his presence. Physically, I was like a dead man. I could not so much as move a finger. 
yet spiritually the heavens stood unveiled before me, causing my state of awareness to be heightened beyond anything I have ever known. Like those strange creatures around God's throne, I felt like I too had, quote, eyes around and within. Revelation 4, 8. If ever wondered what all that was about. Not eyes just out there, but eyes that see in here. I saw things about myself that only God could reveal. And I gained an understanding of Christ's expansive presence and the glory that will be revealed. Remember, this experience occurred after a prolonged time of seeking God. How long? A month. I felt close to the Lord. If someone had asked me how I was doing, I would have, I would have replied, excellent, meaning spiritually. Yet suddenly, I became aware of my true human condition. The flaws in my life became utterly sinful. I saw sin not as something I occasionally committed, but as something I perpetually was. Looking at my heart with the eyes within, I became instantly aware of the many times I could have been more loving or kind or sensitive. I also saw how selfish nearly all of my actions were. Yet, for all that was resident within me of unrighteousness, I felt no rebuke from the Lord, nor condemnation. The only words I heard were my own, in the light of his presence. I abhorred myself, as Job said, Job 42, 6, I abhor myself when he saw the Lord after all that testing he'd been through. And then he saw the one who had allowed the test. And he said, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Without any buffer of self-justification or deceit, with no other person but God to whom to compare myself, I saw how far short of his glory I truly was. I knew why mankind needed the blood of Christ. And I knew that no amount of personal attainment in and of itself could ever make me like Jesus. In italics, I understood that only Christ could live like Christ in him. God's plan was not to improve me, but to remove me so that the Son of God could live his life through me. In his indwelling would rest my hope of becoming like him. I observed things that were intimately personal and I also beheld events ordained for the future. In the far distant night sky, I witnessed, as it were, the most glorious heavenly procession. The blazing and holy presence I felt in my bedroom emanated from this distant passage of supernatural beings. In the forefront were pairs of magnificent angels. There were archangels, cherubim, seraphim, thrones, and dominions, angels of every class and order. Each pair was uniquely dressed in a glorious color. Each was radiant in a splendor all its own. About one third of the way back, because he's looking right into a, a mass of humanity, angels and people, about one third of the way back was the Lord. His glory was like the sun in the midst of beautiful, multicolored stars. Holy Spirit, give us revelation way beyond these words. 
way beyond these words, give us revelation today that we may see you in your magnificent splendor and pristine purity, unfathomable love, and your absolute justice as a God who exercises judgment. We want to see all of you. Don't shortchange us and help us to be honest when we say we will pay the price because we haven't a clue what it means until it happens. But just cause us to be honest. Put the fear of the Lord upon us. Cause us not to ask for something we're not prepared to go through with. We ask that in Jesus' name, believing. I go on reading now. Beyond Jesus were innumerable saints, but I could not clearly could not see clearly beyond the Lord's glory. His splendor so enveloped those following him, it was as though they had become part of his being. The glory was so intense. It was obvious that the light which illuminated the entire procession emanated from him. I realized that the Lord was not just coming to judge the earth, but to fill the earth with his glory. I cannot tell you in words about this glory, but even though the Lord seemed quite distant, the radiance of his presence was like a living fire upon my consciousness. The energy was almost painful. Suddenly, and without warning, the procession came closer. Not just to me, now listen to this, because this, is his, this was history being made, and it refers to this time now. Listen. Suddenly, remember this was 1971. Suddenly and without warning, the procession came closer. Not to, just to me, but I am convinced also to this whole world. In other words, there was a shift. And there's going to be another shift. It was as though a mark in time or a spiritual boundary had been crossed. The instant that occurred, my spiritual consciousness became so overwhelmed by the outraying glory of Christ that I could not, no, not for another second, bear the intensity of his presence. He couldn't take it. He couldn't bear it. Not for one second. I felt as though my very existence, I have this underlined, would be consumed by the blast furnace of his radiance. We don't know Jesus yet. We don't understand what it means to ask for his glory. The Holy Spirit has put the cry in your heart but don't kid yourself, you know the consequences. Just be honest and tell God whether you're re re ready and willing to endure the consequences. This was a pastor at the end of four weeks fasting and seeking God, and he couldn't stand it. Listen to what he says. I'll read that again. I felt as though my very existence would be consumed by the blast furnace of his radiance. In the deepest prayer I have ever uttered, my entire being begged the Lord to return me to my body. Suddenly, mercifully, I was cocooned once again in the familiar world of my senses and my bedroom. Night passed into dawn, and the sunrise was quickly overrun by the full expanse of the day. I arose, dressed, and went outside. With each step, I pondered the vision. I guess that's all I have recorded. Have you learned anything? That wasn't much of a response. Have you learned anything? Yes. Just let's get honest. Don't mutter to God. Speak out what's the truth. 
You're not answering to me. I'm not in charge. I didn't have the faintest idea that I was going to read that today. No clue. And I have been in a month of intense seeking the face of God day after day for this day. He was a month and I've been a month. And I didn't have any idea. But I'm not in charge. I don't know anything more preposterous than people who are called of God to bring the word of the Lord to do anything else but pay whatever price God says to bring that rhema word at that moment to the exact people. You can go a whole lifetime and be in church and in, and in Christian me meetings and never once hear the word of the Lord. Do you know that? I'm grateful for the pastor of this church who understands what I'm speaking about. He nodded his head. He understands what I'm saying. It's truth. Right, David? Okay. Another one. You ready for another one? Yes. Do you really want another one? Yes. Good. You're going to get it. Whether you wanted it or not. But, <laughs> but it's good to hear that you wanted it. It shows you're hungry. It shows you're serious about today which is the most encouraging thing that could happen to me, that you are taking this as seriously as God wants you to. You're getting there anyway. Okay, another quote from George Stormont's book entitled Smith Wigglesworth, A Man Who Walked With God, Tulsa, Harrison House with the publishers in 1989. We have the following account. If you think that was something, listen to this one. In 1922, when Swift Mickelsworth, who was an evangelist, was ministering in Wellington, New Zealand, he called for a special prayer meeting with a group of 11 spiritual elders. After each of them had prayed, Wigglesworth, Wigglesworth stood to seek the Lord and the presence of God. Didn't, did you notice they all prayed, but he sought the Lord's presence? See, see the difference? They just shot off their mouths, and he realized we don't know how to pray as we ought, and was seeking the Lord's presence before he did a prayer. That's a huge teaching right there. Um, and the presence of God began to fill the room. Soon, the glory of God became terrible. I didn't write this. This is, a, this is a report. The light became too bright, the heat too intense, the other men couldn't take it any longer, every one of them left the room, only Wigglesworth could continue in the Shekinah glory of God. Another minister heard what had happened and determined at the next gathering, no matter how strong the presence of God became, he would stay until the end. Once again, the holy presence of God filled the room and the glory became unbearable. Everyone left except this one leader. He would not be overcome and driven out by the manifest presence of the Lord. But it was too much. Wigglesworth was caught up in the spirit radiant with holy fire. And even the determined minister couldn't stand the intensity. Soon enough, he was gone too. Are you learning anything? Yes. Do you still want to sing passionately? Yes. We want the glory? Yes. Have you already been ruined for the ordinary then? Yes. Good for you. Did this help you? Yes. Who of you had a far greater sense of the fear of God as I read those two, of what it means to be in the glory of God? Now we're getting more honest. God sees your heart. Don't mess around. Don't waste God's time. He sees your heart anyway. <laughs> 